Now, <coughs> interestingly, I speak in public a lot. I'm, I work at a university, I'm, I'm a lecturer, and uh, I do a fair amount of public speaking. And uh, recently I published a book, and I've done some talks in the university and in other locations uh, to talk about my book. Um, and yet I'm strangely nervous today. Strangely nervous because I felt a, a, a message coming through the other day saying, you don't need any notes. Speak <coughs> without notes. If you're incapable of delivering what you want to share without notes, then it's not really worth sharing. Um, you're certainly capable of standing and telling people what it is that you've discovered on your funny journey. So I felt that, so I said, OK, I'll have no notes. And as a result, I'm quite nervous. But that's not, all, that's not only it. The other thing is, over the last quite recent part of my life, I've had this feeling that I should not hide behind what I consider to be an academic mode of writing. And by that, I was feeling that I was needing to conform to standards set by some distant panel of stern judges. And every statement I make, whether it's in a presentation or in something I've written, an article, a chapter in a book, or a book itself, I've had to defend 28 times with C. Jones 1998 and C. Smith 1996 and C. Chapter 2 of that. And let me tell you about all the other people who've done this, because I'm not telling you about myself. Well, I'm going to tell you about myself, and that's the reason I'm really nervous. It's not the lack of nerves. So bear with me. And if it's a bit strange, then, well, that's so good easy. So this title that I chose, it could have been anything else. Ultimately, what I'm saying is there is this word that seems to have piqued my interest, and there's a word that has somehow emerged in my, um, in my work, in my... Well, Research is work, in my, in my life's work, what I'm doing, what I'm looking at, what I'm feeling is important for me to invest my time and discuss. And ultimately, I have to be honest, what the state is paying me to do. So it better be good. Um, I better not waste the time. And if I feel that I am deserving of this position in working in a university and being paid to dig around in my own mind and dig around in libraries and archives and talk to people, then it better be good. And if it's not good, then again, I'm in the wrong game. So I had this real call to, to say, right, OK, you can speak. You can say what it is. You can say exactly what it is without having to bludgeon people with endless quotation of so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so else and so-and-so -and -so else and see what so-and-so's done. It's been a very useful strategy for me up to about now. And therefore, this particular question about mysticism has been an absolute encapsulated little moment of this movement that I'm feeling within me from seeing what other people have done and telling other people what other people have done to now turning the focus and saying, this is what other people have done and see how it's guided me and see where it's taken me. And it's taken me to some strange conclusions that change from day to day. Um, so today, my conclusions will be very different from tomorrow, but that's OK. So you caught me today. So this is particular to this particular moment. Who knows? Tomorrow, I might change my mind. Or not. So I was working in um, what I would call loosely uh, Hispanic studies. That's certainly the discipline I work in, the, the university department I work in, Hispanic studies. And my focus is in particular Latin American literature. And I paid close attention to a poet from Cuba called José Les Amalima. Um, and I dedicated my life to him for the purpose of <coughs> explaining what I felt he was saying. And I did this for my PhD. And I then moved from a, from, from, to a, another voice who'd been calling me since I was a teenager when I first read his works. And as I say in the introduction to my book, he spun me down the rabbit, rabbit hole from which I've never returned. And that is Borges. And two years ago, I spoke about Borges at the previous Breaking Convention. So in both cases, I've been led into the work of these authors. And a word that has emerged from time to time, when we're looking, for example, in the case of Borges, at some of his extraordinary tales, and in fact, he published a collection called Extraordinary Tales, um, discussing with other people, discussing in seminar groups with undergraduates, talking with my colleagues, talking with other readers, going to conferences, talking. A word that kept coming up for me uh, was mysticism. And it also took me into looking particularly at his relationship with Emanuel Swedenborg. Um, but I won't dwell on Swedenborg today. 
I did on Thursday at the Swedenborg Society, which was quite an interesting experience. So um, I'll leave Swedenborg slightly aside, but nevertheless, for those who don't know, do have a look at Swedenborg. He was an 18th century man who talked with the angels. I'll say no more. Have a look at Swedenborg. Just make a note in the back of your mind, and one day, just find Swedenborg and see if he's got anything to say. He might, he might not. So, a word emerged that, that captivated my interest, this word mysticism. And of course, I felt some kind of obligation to answer, well, what, what is mysticism? And it was then that I realised there is such a thing, well, I call it that, but there are plenty of people who call themselves scholars. Well, we're all scholars, every one of us, everywhere. But there are people who call themselves scholars who have actually looked at this word and they've said, right, mysticism, let's, get to, let's, get, let's take it to task, let's find out what it means. So, the name that comes to everyone's mind, I say that, no, the word that often comes to people's mind, the name that often comes to people's mind is William James. William James published a chapter in the Varieties of Religious Experience called A Chapter on Mysticism. And his work on mysticism is very powerful um, and has really sort of set a whole scene throughout the 20th century, because he was at the turn of the last century. Um, I've heard references to William James over the course of this weekend, which has been lovely. And people have tried to conceptualise and understand and look at the traditions, whether it's Catholic, whether it's Hindu, such as Zainer looked at these different traditions, Catholic, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, Native American, all sorts of different traditions, and trying to come to an understanding of, well, what is mysticism? And there's a whole scholarship, which I'm not even going to try and summarise, because there's no way I can. But one of the things that happens is people, is these scholars tend to come up with defining characteristics. So a little, a little list, a little list of what mysticism means. Well, the first thing that occurred to me is that this list is crazy, because the words are themselves as weird as mysticism. So William James, for example, says ineffable. Right, but let's we stop to ask, well, what does ineffable mean? No, we, we have no idea because it's ineffable. And so it actually opens a question which itself is, has got beautiful circularity. Um, but it's not a closure by any standards. Um, and these other values that people may know, and noetic, because this has come up in some of the talks this weekend, um, noetic and passive and transient, etc., etc. Well, they're the four. Those are the four. But then with subsequent scholars, there are greater lists and different lists, and there's refutation, and there's argument, and one scholar says that previous scholar didn't have something right. For example, the whole issue, and this is something that I write about in the chapter from the Breaking Convention book that you will have all received, is this peculiar scholarship uh, debate between psychedelics and mysticism. And it's a fascinating area where you see people getting very hot under the collar about it. No, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. Wonderful. Okay, so all this, it suddenly it came to me as a moment of revelation that this is mystical. This is crazy stuff. A book which is trying to conceptualise mysticism is a mystical text. It's talking about experience. And it's talking in the same language, although it has the pretense... No, that sounds negative. It, it has the, the clothing of scholarship. It is scholarly. Of course it's scholarly. But everything's scholarly. It is having, it's producing a list of words. Now that list is such as an allegorical journey that St. Teresa describes, or perhaps another allegorical journey that you might find in early Christian illuminated manuscripts, uh, the Book of Kells or, or the Brendan, uh, the, manus the Brendan manuscript. These are allegorical journeys. And of course, when Evelyn Underhill is producing a book of scholarship about mysticism, she's actually producing a, a text which is itself guiding you, the reader, through the mystical experience. So my first big moment of revelation was there is no distinction between what we might call on the one hand the scholarship of mysticism and what we might call on the other hand mysticism. There's no distinction. There's no division between what is an object being studied and what is the point of reference from which that object is being studied. It's the same thing. Because all the scholars who are looking at mysticism, well, what's driving them? Why would they invest their time and their psychic energy and their money, and sometimes their reputation. Why would they be investing all this in trying to define a word unless it really meant something tremendous to them? And that's even, and I'll push that quite hard, I became quite interested in Bertrand Russell, um, a fascinating man, a really fascinating man. 
Now, he actually took a lot of time to try and work through mysticism. And he laid out some very rational arguments as to why it's effectively not really worthy of study. But, of course, he was studying it, and he did. And he went a long way to say, ultimately, it's not worthy of study. And then you realise that his whole work was searching for a definition of mysticism in its own funny way. Um, and so, therefore, a text like two of his particular essays, which were written at the beginning and the end of his career, uh, one was written in the 1960s, one was written in the 1920s, approaching mysticism, um, these are, again, mystical texts. They're part of this, this great trying to understand what it is all about. So there was my first sort of step towards seeing a more holistic picture of this thing that I falsely labelled, and I say that, falsely labelled as the scholarship of mysticism. That's meaningless. It's texts, texts and texts, all trying to conceptualise something which is what we're trying to conceptualise here as well. And we're doing it from all sorts of different ways and different paths, as I said at the beginning. People who have been up rivers and down rivers and into the jungle, jungles of themselves and jungles out there, well, they're the same. Uh, and, coming, and the word mysticism is just a suitable key to unlock a door into a world of exploration. And we could use mysticism, we could use something else. And what's particular about some of the strange aspects of the scholarship of mysticism is there's a lot of debate about what the nature of the doorway is, or what the nature of the key is. And at one stage I thought, well, surely this is just a sort of, um, you know, this is preventing you actually going into the door, or going through into that space, until I realised, no, 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 this is itself part of that space. And it's again what we're doing here. There are some talks which are on very, very specific details, looking at very fine aspects of a particular uh, paradigm or a particular context or a particular concept, and looking with great detail. And we're looking at archives or we're looking at specific religious traditions or spiritual traditions, and we're having debates and arguments. That's very healthy. We're having positions where we're saying, no, look, I don't think you're right there, because it may be coming from this. And somebody then incorporating that new voice that's being presented into their work, you know, to the degree of acceptance or rejection as they, as they deem necessary at that time in their, in their development, in their journey. And at the same time, we're having talks where an entire panorama is being presented. So it's not so much on the finer details on this particular matter, it is on a broader picture. And questions, for example, we realise that we're actually engaging in our own collective, tremendous shadow work here. For example, at session yesterday, which I didn't attend, but I kind of got the feel of what was being discussed there, in terms of talking about ayahuasca tourism. These are questions of us turning, the, turning back on ourselves and saying, are we being good? Are we dropping litter on our search into the Amazon? Are we, are we, are we doing it right? Because we think we are. We think we are in all the things we're doing. We're discussing that. We're saying, are we doing it right? Is this the right way? And then you have people saying, well, hold on. Think about it from this way. And think about it from this way. This is all the same thing as the scholarship of mysticism, what I hold. It's about saying, well, that's your approach. Does it work for you? It does work for me. No, it doesn't work for me. Well, I don't agree with the position that you're saying, because for me, it's different. Cool. Take that in. And there you see the whole, that, that particular debate between psychedelics and mysticism. It's healthy. It's beautiful. At one stage, I was a bit flummoxed by it, a bit, a, bit, a bit sort of, oh, this is weird. Why are people getting so hot under the collar? Well, because they're working out different parts. And there's no need to agree. There's no need to form a consensus. In fact, a consensus is precisely what we don't want. We want this healthy, healthy debate. And so Huxley, for example, deeply versed in different religious traditions, when he first took mescaline, he was, he was dumbfounded. What, do I, what, what language do I use? Well, what language did he use? He used language of religious traditions. Why? Because he knew this language and it, was, it, 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 was, it seemed appropriate. This is the only language I can use to describe this extraordinary state I've been in. And therefore some of the people who then came after saying he has no right to use those words because they belong to a specific religious tradition. He's saying, okay, but these were the words that were most appropriate. So maybe there's something in that connection between this state that I was in, which was about everything that I've been in, but then a particular doorway was opened. This is what I've been reading. So, again, this is producing <coughs> this, this, this lovely friction, this friction between different people's perspectives. And that friction takes us ever further. It produces the energy that takes us further and further 
because your, your interest is piqued in something. Somebody has refuted another person's argument, and you're thinking, really? Let me explore further. And it takes you deeper into that. And you then drive the whole field of human understanding deeper into these strange realms. This then led me to realize, sorry, that was quite a long digression going up there, so I'll come back down to this pathway down here, back to the central river, off that tributary. So, my first sort of big moment of revelation was seeing that the scholarship of mysticism was itself mystical. And my second moment of revelation was understanding that everything that I'd been doing by, in the work that I'd been doing, had been guided by my ancestor spirits, my spirits. And who were those spirits? They were these authors. They were literature. Literature is a magical system through which these poets from the past, Borges is dead, Les Amalina is dead, but of course they're not dead because they've spoken to me and they've guided me and they've opened a door saying, look, mysticism, go in there, go and rummage in that library, go on, have a go, spend some time in there, it's crazy, believe me, but go in there. So I go in there and I start running through the volumes and I pick up James and Underhill and Zayna and Stace and I look at psychedelics and all this and then they say, right, come on, we've got more. And then at a certain stage they're saying, right, you no longer need to tell other people about what we've done. Your work so far has been brilliant, and thank you. We like the fact that you've been doing that. That's a message I, I should have felt. We're flattered, we're delighted. You have really invested a lot of time in our work, in our poetry. Thank you, well done, all right? But now, stop hiding behind under our cloaks. That's a sort of Luke Skywalker metaphor, you know, sort of Obi-Wan, you yeah. um, know. You don't have to tell other people what we've done. Right? I mean, certainly use us as illustrations. In fact, please do. Yeah. So you could say, well, I had my apprenticeship in whichever martial art with Master Zui or Master Chui. Yeah, I'll say that. I'll say Master Chui taught me these things. In this case, it's not Chinese martial arts. It's, it's the magical system of literature through which a voice can speak to the reader. And at a certain moment, the reader goes, oh my God, I'm the reader. This was written for me. This was written for me. I'm the reader. It's not, I'm just a reader of any old text. This text was written for me. And I'm really deeply, deeply engaged in it. And it's telling me something. This is the ancestor spirit coming through. I say ancestor spirit, who cares what it's called? This is a voice coming through. The voice which is part of this greater web of intercommunication and interconnection between us all as individual and collective moments of psyche. And so the sort of language that I was feeling, the sort of lessons I was feeling was an urging from these two, from Lesama and from Borges. I say their names because that's the work I've been dealing with. And they're saying, go on, go and tell other people about it now. And that's what, for me, my whole work in looking at the scholarship of mysticism, and for example, I gave a talk at the October Gallery when I say, well, Zayna said this and Stace said that and this and that and the other. I haven't done that at all today. Because it's now like, well, what do I say? Well, I'm not going to give you four defining characteristics. What I'm going to say is simply go back to the beginning of what I've just said, if you can remember it. I, I can't remember it. And, and that's my kind of defining position. If anyone wants to make four defining points from that, I'd be delighted. But um, they wouldn't be very good. Well, they might be. They might be wonderful. Um, I've no idea how long I've gone. Or I've, I've... Well, I'll stop there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, five minutes questions. I can't guarantee to answer them. I might just turn them back on them. This question on the, the first point about um, the study of mysticism being mystical. So, do you, I mean, for me, I mean, I guess traditionally people would say that it's like, a, you know, the, the, an anthology about mysticism, for example, might be like a finger pointing at the moon, or like the word ineffable, and that it points to a referent that can't be understood through language. So, do you see it in that way? Do you think that mysticism is beyond language? And to clarify what you mean by the study, the actual study of the theme is the experience. I mean, it teaches you to objectively give you that transcendent experience of each of Well, I mean, it. By saying it, we're already giving it a name, as if it is something. I don't think it is anything. I think mysticism is just a suitable word, and then tomorrow it could change something else. 
Um, is it ineffable? Well, isn't everything ineffable? Because at the end of the day, a word for coffee is not coffee. You don't drink a cup of the word coffee. Um, you drink a cup of coffee. So there's something ineffable about there's something ineffable about every aspect of our experience. Or you could turn that around and simply say, well, everything is language. So is it or is it not ineffable? Well, yes. <laughs> discussing uh, the, the, the texts themselves and the, the, the feeling that they are transferring some kind of knowledge of spirit so that you can at some point let them go in order to present the mysticism which everyone can have access to. Is it really necessarily in that everyone can have access? No, not at all. I'm just telling my story. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But would it, would it, would it not be the case that, okay, so you are telling your story, is that what I'm trying to ask then is, is that mysticism accessible to those who do not partake of that knowledge and as far as you... Well, I can't answer that. You're asking about yourself. You're saying, is what I've just said available to you? Well, I have no, no, no idea. What I'm saying is that, if, is that present, what are you presenting then? Is, is there a... I'm presenting what I've just done, my story. Um, I don't know how to put that another way. I'm, I'm presenting a hypothesis backed up with rigorous analysis leading to a conclusion with <coughs> footnotes and a bibliography. But Thank in you. A sense, in a sense, that's what you're doing. And an appendix. In a sense, that's what you're doing because of your tradition, the fact that you're a PhD, the fact that you have a body of work and books. Yeah. So in a sense, by the normal presentation, I mean, I feel that, that there's something to what you're saying that I feel drawn to it. And yet, I, I wonder about the possibility that it may negate those who do not have access through writing and reading to an equal experience to be able okay. to present with you. I don't, I don't claim to be giving you guys a mystical experience. I never, I never no, set no, no, out no, to I'm do saying, that. But you might have had one. But whether it's more accessible for others to be able to present in their own way what they are going to accomplish. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. No, no, yes. Uh, <laughs> That's what. Everyone's story is different, and uh, and they're all they're all their own particular ways. Some are, have a particular style. Some are painters. Some are music. I've chosen a particular style, and it's now starting to work. I hope it may not. I might have to get a different job. Learn the flute. Hi. Ah, well, I could answer that in a way. That's a good question. Did you all hear the question? No. Um, it's like, has that led to any decision about what my next project will be? How you are going to kind of the methodology you are going to use? Because I think there is... Really yeah, yeah, no, I think the methodology is about me, right? There we are. Very egotistical. No, what I mean is that the next project could be about just me and my interaction with my work, my family, my friends. Um, if I've learned anything, then hopefully what I've learned is something which is of value. And therefore there's a moment when you stop discussing it and embodying it. So I've no idea what my next project would be. It could be something very archive research. How are you going to communicate this new um, knowledge that you have within the academia? Are you still interested to communicate with that type of yeah. environment. Yeah. How are you going to formalise it? I'm going to continue what I'm doing, hopefully. And maybe just allow my voice to shine through a little bit clearer. I mean, sorry, I hope I didn't present a picture where I was giving any sort of negative perspective on what I consider to be the rigours of scholarship. On the contrary, I think that what the discipline of scholarship is the most robust, it's an excellent way, it's one of the many ways like art, like music, it's one of the many ways of approaching a particular field of human experience and quizzing it and testing it and looking at different perspectives and looking where, which is more and which is less robust. So not for one minute was I making, and I, I'm not suggesting this was your interpretation, but anyway, but I want to just clarify that, that my sort of evaluation of, of, of the mode of, of discourse that is considered academic is that it's, it's huge, it is what we're doing anyway. If you can present a suitable story and if you can illustrate it in a way which is somehow coherent, <coughs> then that's what it is. Um, is it academic? Is it not? Well, it's just a story. Here we are. I'm being very evasive in my answers. Aren't <laughs> <you>? <laughs> Thank you.